spiritual momentum. How do you get it and how do you keep it? I want to share some thoughts before we come around the Lord's table today because I think my thoughts will, will be help you to connect with Christ and maybe to make some shifts in your attitudes and in your behaviours on how to really connect more effectively with Jesus and appropriate all that he has made available for you and he wants to do through you. And so we're talking about momentum. Next week I'll talk about church momentum. But really, when we talk about spiritual, personal momentum, what happens in you is going to rub off on others and collectively as a church community, there's something like a collective momentum that develops. So today's message is connected very much to next week. So how do you get it? How do you keep it? Well, it's, it's actually quite simple. I just sat down and thought, well, I've been a Christian for 46 years. I've had my ups and I've had my downs. And there's been some times when this is my 39th year leading the church. Yes, yeah, three times I've tried to quit, write my resignation letter, but didn't send it, praise the Lord. And, and received help from people in, in times of personal crisis and difficulty. So, um, but I think if I didn't have these foundations in my life, I reckon I would have crashed and burnt in that first resignation in 1983. I think as I look back on how have I maintained the fire and the fervency, not perfection, gosh, not sinlessness. There's only one who is sinless, his name is Jesus. Uh, we believe in Christian perfection, not sinless perfection, where we're growing as Christians and getting better, okay? The, the wine is maturing with age, isn't that right? We, the, the victory of Christ and the, the vehicle of, of our own souls, we, we, we're getting better because Jesus is better and we're letting him have his sway in our hearts and lives. So how do you get and keep it? Firstly, you've got to read yourself full. Paul to Timothy says these words. Now remember, Timothy didn't have the New Testament. We have the New Testament. We're reading Mark at the moment as a church. We're up to Mark chapter 5, reading a chapter a day in our Bible readings. Now, Timothy didn't have the New Testament. you imagine not having the New Testament, how poor we would be in our understanding? And yet he had the Old Testament. And this is what Paul said to him. He said, son, remember how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, Genesis to Malachi which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus. In other words, these scriptures revealed Jesus to you, the eternal Christ. The eternal Christ is in these pages, and they're able to make you wise for salvation. Timothy, you've discovered Christ in the Word, and Timothy you've experienced the Christ of the Word. And you know what? We can as well. We will see Jesus better and we will experience him more fulsomely when we get a picture of him as the Scriptures portray. And so he says all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for what? For teaching? We like that. Yep, teach me, Bill, teach me. For rebuking? Oh, don't like that one. The Scripture rebukes us, corrects us, realigns us trains us in righteousness, understanding our right standing with him and in righteous living, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Folks, the more you read and reflect and meditate on the Holy Scriptures and imbibe into your inner being the words of God, the more revelation you will receive about Jesus. And I tell you, more of the Bible in you and you will get a, an understanding, and not just revelation, but you'll experience it, that Jesus will appear to you more powerful, and he will do amazing things in you. Look, if you read this, uh, actually I've read through and checked out how many scriptures are you. I think it's about 100 scriptures. I've tried to put every key scripture about who we are in Christ in there, maybe more than 100, might be 150 scriptures. 
because I know the more of the word that we get into us, the more our understanding of Christ increases and the more the revelation of it will grip us so that we're able to reach out to him in faith and say, Lord, I want everything you've got to offer. What you've made available for me through your life, death, resurrection and your ongoing ministry. Jesus, I don't just don't want to know about you. I want to know you and experience the fullness of what the cross has made available. Paul says, I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know him. I want to know him, what he did for me, who he is and what he did and the power of his resurrection, his new life in me. So read yourself full. Maybe this year you need to say, you know what, I, I do the Bible readings every so often, but maybe to say, you know what, every day I'm going to read at least a chapter. I'll follow our Bible reading plan here at the Christian Family Centre or make up my own. Secondly, pray yourself hot. Paul says to the Thessalonian Christians, pray continually or pray another translation says without ceasing how the heck do you pray without ceasing how do you pray continually does anyone pray without ceasing is it is it possible actually it is possible when you understand what prayer is you see prayer our prayer life really for me prayer reveals how dependent I am on Jesus. So it's not a matter of how the, the, the practice of prayer, which I practice it on a daily basis, where I set time aside to pray and read the scripture. Okay, and I think that's important. Jesus put time aside where he read a portion of scripture or had a, read a scroll where he talked to the Father. He separated himself from even his disciples. He just needed time out. I think that's important. Nehemiah is a great example for me. In fact, the book I'm writing, The Me, The Leader I Can Be, is based on Nehemiah, who I think is just the most magnificent leader. And I see Nehemiah, he has a season of prayer, the practice of prayer, where he's seeking God with prayer and fasting for three months in Susa, under King Artaxerxes. He's the cupbearer to the king. And God does a number on him and gives him a call and enables him and clearly directs him in relation to what his life call is going to be. So he ends up becoming the governor of the new province of Judea so the Jews could return and he was there to, to rebuild the wall. But it's interesting, in the 12 years that he was there, he never had a season of three months of prayer and fasting. In fact, you don't find him in the practice of prayer. You know what you find him in? In the mode of prayer. In other words, he had done his seeking... But now he understood that he's practicing the presence of Jesus. And as he is working, as he is talking, as he is warring, he's shooting up his prayers to God. Someone's given him a hard time, like Sam Ballot and Tobiah, and, he's, and he's, as he's talking to them and they're talking to him, he goes, oh, Jesus, help me. Well, actually, one of his prayers is, oh, Lord, give it to them in the neck. <laughs> not quite, not very Christian prayer. Or oh, he's having trouble and he goes, oh, Lord, remember me. I'm in trouble. And he's just shooting his prayers up as he's working, as he's warring, as he's worshipping. So it's the mode of prayer that I'm talking about that reveals our dependence upon him. I doubt whether 30 minutes would pass in my day, and maybe you ought to assess yourself, without me shooting a prayer up to Jesus about something. About something. I might be writing a letter, I might be talking to somebody, I might be talking to, I might be, it might be a really difficult situation. I'm thinking, oh Lord, I don't know what to say. So I'm just saying, Lord, you better help me. So I'm, I'm t the person doesn't know that I'm praying. I'm praying in my heart, but I'm talking to Jesus and amazingly how God will come through. So it's the mode of prayer. So I tend to start my day with the Lord's Prayer. What's the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, it's all about God. His kingdom, his worth, his name, his will being done. Not about my kingdom, my will, my name, etc. It's good to center yourself, say it's about him. But then we have needs, physical, financial, material needs. Give us this day our daily bread. It's not just saying give me a loaf of bread, it's saying, meet, Lord, I have some needs. Or you might have some relationship difficulties or attitudinal stuff that's going down and, and, and you're thinking, Lord, I'm not living in forgiveness. And that prayer which he says, and what? Forgive us 
our trespasses, our sins, as we have forgiven those who have trespassed against us. That's all about the psychological, relational realm, how we need to live that way. Or the enemy might be giving you a hard time. There's temptations, there's difficulties. You need guidance. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, our spiritual needs. And so in any given day, I, I think if, if you create and build your own altar with God, and you can build an altar with God. Abraham did. What you have to do is go and find some great big stones and get them out the back of your house and build it up at 12 foot high and that's your altar to worship God. Isn't that right? My altar is a beautiful white chair sitting in my office. It's fant- In fact, it's so good I could go to sleep in it. It's stuck in the corner so people can't see. I've got... That's my little place. That's where I build my altar. The other area of my altar is the Torrens Linear Park. I grab my phone, I stick on some Bible reading, stick it in there, and without earpieces, because I want people to hear the Word of God as I'm, as I'm walking. <laughs> Loud. And Jesus said, as people are looking. <laughs> so I'm, I'm walking, not running, walking. For 30 minutes, that's my altar. Up to the second bridge one way, and then the next day I might go up to the second bridge the second way, and the Word of God is speaking to me. Great slabs of Scripture. And through it, I'm also just talking to God, usually the Lord's prayers, just those issues. Okay, so build an altar. It may be walking down the beach, doing your exercise, stick your phone there. Do something on a regular basis that you practice prayer, practice the presence of Jesus and get the word of God flowing into you and start talking to him. Have a look at the the mode of prayer. I love this scripture in Philippians 4, one of my favorites. How do you practice the presence of Jesus? Don't be anxious about anything, Paul says. So after you do the Lord's Prayer at the beginning of the the day, because throughout the day, don't be anxious about anything because there's lots of anxieties that come our way. There's worries, there's problems, there's issues. I mean, do you ever stop worrying? Do you ever stop worrying? Do you ever stop thinking and reflecting and worrying? about the issues of life. Well, he says anxiety and worry can be sinful if you don't inject God into it. And if you let those worries conquer you and affect you, you're going to get ill. You're not going to function too well. So Paul says the antidote, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, talk to God. Shoot up that Nehemiah prayer. And then petition, ask God. Say, God, I need help for this or that. I need this amount of money. I need this situation. My daughter's going through this. My little grandchild's doing this. And and, uh, that neighbor is just being so difficult. Give it to him in the neck, you know, and stuff like that. That's a Nehemiah prayer. We're in the New Testament. We now bless those that curse us, okay? Then he says, talk to God, petition, and then with thanksgiving. You've got to inject faith into your prayers. And that means you've got to start thanking God that he's good, that he's great, that he's answered your prayer. And not on the basis that, oh, if you give it to me tomorrow, then I'll be thankful. No, he says, be thankful that the answer's on the way. And the answer may may not be what you think it will be. That's what faith's all about. So talk to God, petition him, and then inject a dimension of faith which reveals itself in thanksgiving. God, you're good. God, you're great. God, you're sovereign. God, you're loving. The answer's on the way. I thank you. Lift that anxiety from me now. And notice what he says. And the peace of God, the peaceful presence of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Wow. Pray yourself hot, folks. Practical. This is not theoretical. This is how I live. And it's not been super spiritual. I'm busy and I work hard and I have time. And when I build my altar, really, really, it just takes about 30 minutes. And if you have that altar, 30 minutes to go for the walk, 30 minutes. And if you're reading one chapter a day, just one and and observe it. Wash yourself with it, observe it, apply it, pray over it. God will speak to you. And then maybe use the gift of speaking in your new prayer language for 10 minutes in that 30 minute slot. So you might be reading the scripture for 10 minutes and meditating on it. And then just start to pray in the spirit. Use your spiritual prayer language, which is really the third point. Allow yourself to be empowered and led by the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.4, one of my favorite scriptures. All of them, all those who believed. And you know what? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're part of the all. All of you can be filled with the Holy Spirit and receive the evidence of speaking in a brand new heavenly language. 
the language of speaking in, in words that I haven't been able to make up, that the Holy Spirit inspires me to speak the finest words of the angelic hosts and the finest words of human languages the Holy Spirit takes in perfect prayer. Prayer is when I don't know how to pray in English or in Greek because I can pray in both languages. And when I'm stuck, I don't know what to do, I can use that spiritual prayer language. When Tanny was leading us this morning, oh man, you know, when she said, just let it go a little bit, people. I noticed some of you speaking in that language. If you're sitting in the front row, you would have heard me. I'll go for it. Not overtly loud to draw attention to myself, but I'm worshipping Jesus. Use the gift. It's a precious gift. And he says here, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled them. The gift to speak in a special prayer language is so precious and so valuable. Folks, it strengthens my inner life to help me grow in Christ, to receive healing from issues that arise. I need the lubricating influence of the Holy Spirit all over my soul. Like my car needs the oil in the sum to get the thing moving. You don't have oil in the car and you start driving the thing, you're going to seize the thing up. And so many Christians are seized up because they don't allow the Holy Spirit to lubricate every dimension of their life. And you need him to help you, to enable you, to grow you, to heal your soul. It's the only manifestation of the Spirit, hear me on this, or gift of the Holy Spirit, that is yours permanently. Paul lists nine gifts of the Holy Spirit that he gives. In 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 11, the power to speak, tongues, interpretation and prophecy. The power to, to know wisdom and knowledge and discernment of spirits or between spirits and the power to do faith healing and miracles all the other eight gifts are resident in the holy spirit because if they are permanently in me for example if the gift of wisdom then i'd be forever the wise one come to me and i have wisdom all the time if knowledge come to me and, I'll, and i have perfect knowledge no way in certain contexts of ministry I need the gift of wisdom, I need the gift of knowledge, I need discerning between spirits. Is this of God, is this of man, is this of the devil? In delivering Jimmy Vassos in his story, I still remember, I, I was learning and I had to get Pastor Harris to help me, my, the founder of the CRC. Was this thing a mental illness or was this, this thing demonic? What's the difference between the neurotic, the psychotic and the demonic? I didn't know, I'm a young kid. So I got the, the master himself and Pastor Harris helped me to see. And we cast out an evil spirit that was tormenting him. Many of them, actually. But then he still needed to get mental health healing from proper counsellors and support and, and with his medication. And then ultimately he came off that. He's a walking miracle. He told you the story. The doctor said, you'll never marry, you'll never hold a job, you'll never be able to do anything in life because we've labelled you. He was three months locked away in a psychiatric unit, so ill as in his late teens. And look at him now, father, husband, father, grandfather, pastor, succeeded in engineering in telecom. I mean, he tells us his story. In fact, I want him to write it up even more to say, you know what? But that discerning of spirits, we had to work that through. Is this thing of God? Is this of man? Is this demonic? And we need those gifts to help us, the power to do. Now, all these eight gifts, the Holy Spirit wants to give them to us in various ministry contexts. So where there's a need and you don't have the answer, God has the answer. So how do you tap into that? I find that the gift of speaking in tongues so often as I'm ministering to somebody, even as I'm preparing a message and I'm stumbled on the scripture, I'll just start to pray in using that prayer language and insight comes on, on the word or revelation or just the, the, the outline of a message will pop in or just wisdom about a, a difficult situation. And so I find that speaking in tongues is like the, the doorknob, the doorway by which I open the door and come into this realm of the spirit. So the more that I speak in this language, then it opens me up to the realm of the supernatural for the other eight gifts because the gift of tongues is for me to strengthen me, the fabric of my life. The other eight gifts are to give away to people in need or who are in trouble. Many years ago, 
I'll disguise the story a little bit. But I remember I had a word of knowledge. Philip knows this one. I had an insight. I'm home preparing a message. And it's a Sunday night service. Only a handful of people. And I felt God gave me a word. So I gave it. And I was convinced it was God. But you, know, you try and say, well, look, maybe I could be wrong. And I said, look, there's a girl here. You've got problems with fear. You, it came because you had an occult experience. You are, I think you're 19 or 20 years. It was really specific. And I couldn't work out whether she had blonde hair or black hair. I've got this picture in my mind. I give it. Nobody responds. And I'm thinking, well, that's great. That was wrong. Didn't get that one right. At least I had the courage to step out and be a fool for Jesus. You know, you can do that as long as you're not there to hurt people. So I'm home the next day, I get a telephone call and it's a girl. It was her. She was there. The first thing I said, my pride said, why didn't you tell us on Sunday night to make me look good? <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I thought that. Terrible thought. See, pride is so wicked. Pride is wicked. You know how evil pride is. You've got to say, oh, devil, get behind me. Anyway, the story is, that was her. Exactly. So she, and then I said to her, what colour hair do you have? She said, oh, actually, I'm a brunette, but I've dyed it blonde. Yeah. Uh, like, I'm thinking, oh, Jesus, I'll never doubt you again. Oh, Lord, you're so... And she got saved. She got saved and is part of the life of our Christian family centre churches. I remember we had... And she wasn't a Christian. We had a Papua New Guinean come and we had a group going into Seton High doing barbecues. And they're full of the Holy Spirit. They're praying in tongues and they're going out there to minister. And there's this young boy who's the loudmouth, uncouth boy. Okay? Swears like a trooper. Anyway, he bunged up his knee. So they see him going like this and, and he comes up to get his snag and they, and they ask him, so what happened to your, to your knee? Oh, with a few swear words. And, and the guys go, well, do you know we believe that Jesus can heal? He goes, well... Oh, 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 Jesus, what? What's, he goes, we, would you like, if we laid hands on your knee and prayed and asked God to heal her? And he goes, oh, all right. They did that. He got instantly healed. Instantly, he's jumping up and down and swearing his head off. <laughs> and they're going, oh, you know, like. Then later on, he gave his life to Christ. Hey, you, you have power in the spirit in you, potential power so the doorway by which that power can flow is as you yield to him and depend upon him and call out to him in various contexts. God could use you to heal the sick person. God could he use you to deliver somebody of an evil spirit by praying. He can use you to give a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, a prophetic insight, a gift of faith to believe in an impossible situation with a family that might be struggling in a matter and they don't have any real faith and you have the faith to believe and you can carry them. It's a gift of faith. These are in the spirit. So, to me, this ain't rocket science. <laughs> this, is, this is like, okay, read myself full, pray myself hot, just allow myself to be empowered and led by the spirit using this wonderful gift. And if you don't haven't received that gift, you can. When we come around the Lord's table and we sing a song, if you've already asked for it and haven't, you, you, as, as you sing, don't just sing in English. Just say, God, I want it. I'm ready. Stop seeing and just, just start to speak in that language. Let the first thought that comes to mind and let the spirit be loosed within you. Then go for a walk down the beach today and let it flow. It's not hard. God wants to give it to you. Ask him. Just have faith. You've got to believe that he will answer you. Hey, fourthly, let me cover these two ones and I want to open these up probably next week a bit more. You've got to get yourself relationally connected. In Hebrews 10.25, the writer says, don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. What's the day approaching? Well, either it's the day of your death, and those of us who are in our 60s, it's, it's closer than it was 20 years ago, or it could be the day when Jesus returns. But he's actually saying here, don't neglect this. I have found you cannot Get my spiritual momentum and keep it if you isolate yourself. If you're a once a month person at church, I'll just come, sit there, and you just think, okay, it's a great service, it's going to be helpful to you, but if you're not connected in a small group or serving in some way with others or you're known within a group, 
It's very hard to maintain spiritual momentum on your own. In fact, in the New Testament, there's no such thing as the individual Christian, the lone ranger Christian. It's not about I, it's about actually, or, 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 or we, it's not about I and me, it's about we and us. It's about community, it's about getting connected with other people. You need people to help you. Man, the, the times when, I, the couple of times when I felt like quitting, there were three people that helped me enormously. And the reason why they helped me is I'm connected to them relationally. And they had the courage to do what the scripture says to correct me. I remember one guy was at that doorway there. He's at a conference. And I'm, I won't tell you the fools, I was just in a bad way. Just in a bad way, internally. It was just, I'm thinking, I, I want to get out of this. I want to go back teaching. Like Peter's, I'm going to go back fishing. I love people, but... No, I love ministry, but, you know, some people drive me crazy. It was just more a pity party. It was more self-pity. It was more internal depression, losing my way, pride, and, and attitudes that developed as a pastor, and it was just really a difficult time. And he grabbed me at, at the door there, and I still remember him pointing his finger at me. But I only felt love. He's a prophet. He's one of our CRC pastors, really strong prophetic minister. He's pointing his finger at me. Bill, I need to say this to you. Boom, 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 boom. And it was like Jesus had turned up and went... <laughs> but it didn't hurt. It didn't hurt. It was loving, speaking the truth in love. But I tell you, if I wasn't connected, I thought, who are you, Charlie? I get lost. I'm not listening to you. Who are you? Like, if you know people and you're in relationship with people and you know they love you and they're credible, then you give them permission to speak into your life. And we need that. We need the word to train us, teach us, correct us, rebuke us. And if he didn't have the courage to rebuke me, I don't know where I would be. And some of you, and we need this. And, and the only way, see, a good friend, see, a friend who doesn't tell you the truth, he stabs you in the back. You know, if they, if they don't tell you the truth and they, they criticise and they're saying they stab you in the back, a good friend will stab you in the front. <coughs> Up front. I'm going to stab you now. <coughs> he tells you. I'm going to cut out that poison. Bill, you need this. See, a person who says they're a friend but they're not prepared to talk to you in love and to share with you, to help you, they're really, they're not a friend. They're not a true friend. And the more we're connected relationally, the more this happens. You see, independence and dependence are unhealthy. If you are independent and you're on your own, or if you're dependent, where you're so dependent on people, it's a codependent relationship, it's like an addiction, and the, the person controls your life and you're not free to be able to think and pray and reflect, and it's, it's cultic, that's not good either. So independence and dependence are wrong. They're unhealthy and they can be dangerous and destructive. But interdependence is healthy and holy and the way that Jesus' followers should operate. And the more connected you are in an interdependent framework, the healthier you'll become. Just look at Jesus. He's the eternal son of God. You would think he would not have any need for other people. He needed his mum and his brothers and his sisters on earth. He needed, he needed his 12 disciples. He needed the three. He needed the 70. He needed his friends, Martha and Mary and, and Lazarus. Jesus, the son of God, needed people around him to stay sane and focused in his humanity. How much more, you and me? Wow, and finally, throw yourself into serving. Roll up your sleeves and do something. Don't wait for God to somehow bring a gift to you and say, whoa, this is what you're called to do five years after you've come to faith. Hey, the moment you become a Christian, roll up your sleeves and start helping build the kingdom. Start serving the Lord in some way. It could be practical, it could be people-oriented, it could be pastoral, it could be instructional, it could be in any way. The scripture says, each of you use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. You are uniquely wired to serve Jesus and you are uniquely wired to add value into people's lives. You'll never be fulfilled in life, you'll never have ultimate satisfaction unless you're living for a cause that's bigger than yourself. And unless you're genuinely adding value to somebody else's life, you're not living a life that, that is really fulfilling. 
And if you put Jesus in there and say, I want to see his kingdom extended, and to be used of him to see his kingdom extended, and you're really helping people, I tell you, satisfaction, fulfillment, you can go forever, forever and ever. <laughs> and uh, so discover your God-given gifts and talents, folks. We're going to do a series on this, I think, in March. We really want to dig this one out. We want you serving because we know it's good for you as well as good for the kingdom. Discover your God-given gifts and talents. Develop them to the max and deploy them for the glory of God and to do as much good to other people as, as possible. These five keys to developing personal spiritual momentum will produce a dynamic Acts 2 kind of church. And we'll talk about that next week. Because what's happening in you, if you can get momentum and keep it, it's going to spill off on others. And you imagine, you grab these five things. You know, remember what I said? Read yourself full, pray yourself hot, allow yourself to be empowered and led by the Holy Spirit, get yourself really connected into community and throw yourself into serving. I tell you, if that's happening in you, it's going to rub off on others and the church will get momentum. So the personal connects with the collective. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Come on, let's stand together. Let's stand.